Uh, so the title of this article, The Joe Rogan Controversy Revealed Something Important About the American Left. And I, I agree with this headline. I, I do think that it's revealed a lot about the American left, like how stupid it is, how out of touch it is with ordinary Americans, how much it embraces cancel culture, how its commitment to social justice warrior moral absolutism absolutely alienates people. So yeah, I think there were a lot of important revelations from this controversy about the American left. I thought I'd make a YouTube video about this Vox article talking about Joe Rogan endorsing Bernie Sanders. Just to set the record clear, I'm not much of a fan of Bernie Sanders or Joe Rogan. To me, Bernie Sanders is the typical rich condescending asshole. You know, the type of person who declares themselves the savior of working people, even though they themselves have never done even a single day of real work in their entire life. Nothing that Bernie Sanders has campaigned on has been even remotely appealing to someone like me. And why would it be? I don't give a shit about free college, because I already had to pay for college. I'm not getting my money back, right? So why would I care about this? Oh, but he's going to give free health care. Well, guess what? Like most Americans, I have a job. My job pays for my health care. So I already have free health care. Now, Bernie Sanders might respond by saying something like, oh, well, what if you lose your job? Then you're really going to be up shit creek then, right? Well, no. My state, like I believe all states, offers free health insurance to people who are unemployed and don't have any income. So I don't see why I would ever give a shit about Bernie Sanders' promise of free health care. It doesn't benefit me at all in any situation that I could find myself in. As I've discussed in other videos on this channel, his proposed criminal justice reforms are a complete joke. And to that guy who keeps on commenting, I don't care how many Bernie Sanders conspiracy theories you throw out there, it doesn't change the fact that the bail bonds industry only makes money when people are released pending a criminal trial. They don't make any money at all when people are held in jail. Bernie Sanders is nothing but a complete joke. I also thought it was completely hilarious when Hillary Clinton said that she wouldn't support him if he were the nominee. After it was revealed that she cheated in the Democratic primary in the previous election, and then Bernie Sanders endorsed her even after it was publicly revealed that she had screwed him over in that primary. The fact that Bernie Sanders refuses to denounce her for this very reason just shows you how pathetic and weak of a candidate he is. So yeah, I'm not someone who likes Bernie Sanders. I also don't really like Joe Rogan that much. I'm sorry, but being an MMA fighter is not an excuse to be a stereotypical Los Angeles douchebag bro type of guy. For someone who's a rich celebrity like Joe Rogan, it's easy for him to get away with sitting around doing drugs every day. However, this is the exact sort of thing that would likely cause a working person, someone who wasn't rich and famous, to ruin their life. In that way, Joe Rogan is a terrible role model. I think the reason that his podcast is so successful is he chooses the right types of guests. People go and watch Joe Rogan because they want to see what his interesting guests have to say. To that end, I'll give him credit. He does seem to select pretty good people to come on his show, but otherwise, I'm not really a big fan. So now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's get to this Vox article. Uh, this article is written by Dylan Matthews. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, we don't need to see any more of Dylan Matthews. We, we can, we can, let's focus on the article here, people. Uh, so the title of this article. The Joe Rogan controversy revealed something important about the American left. And I, I agree with this headline. I, I do think that it's revealed a lot about the American left, like how stupid it is, how out of touch it is with ordinary Americans, how much it embraces cancel culture, how its commitment to social justice warrior moral absolutism absolutely alienates people. So yeah, I think there were a lot of 
important revelations from this controversy about the American left. Now, the reason I decided to make this video on this particular article, this is the type of article that while I'm reading it, I feel like maybe the remnants of whatever type of soul that I have is just kind of withering away. It's the type of article that renders me stupefied. Like I can't believe that someone actually wrote this or thinks this way. Now, years of working for the government has definitely damaged my psyche, but I read articles like this and it's like I'm getting punched in the face. So the article starts out, Comedian and podcast host Joe Rogan's endorsement of Bernie Sanders and the subsequent outrage in gay, trans, and other communities over Sanders' embrace of the endorsement is one of the most intricate and multifaceted political controversies of recent months. Really, you believe that this is one of the most intricate and multifaceted political controversies? Because to me, this seems like a bunch of Twitter bullshit. When I released my video on the feud between Sargon of Akkad and Destiny over who was the biggest cuckold, I went right out and said in the beginning of the video that this controversy amounted to a bunch of bullshit. I said that because I believed then and still believe now that what that controversy amounted to was basically inconsequential nonsense. But I don't have the insight of Vox journalist Dylan Matthews. Perhaps it's the case that the Destiny Sargon cuckold feud was one of the most intricate in multifaceted political controversies of recent months. Anyways, the article continues. But Rogan's popularity is owed in part to his vocal rejection of political correctness, which can take the form of transphobia. He once called a trans woman mixed martial artist, Fallon Fox, a fucking man, Islamophobia, hosting guests like the far-right Proud Boys founder, Gavin McGinnis, who used his empirics to argue that Muslims are too inbred for the U.S. to accept as immigrants, and racism. He wants compared a black neighborhood to Planet of the Apes. This paragraph is a perfect example of neoliberal propaganda. Neoliberals don't believe in democracy. They don't believe in politics. They certainly aren't interested in the views of working people. So what they do whenever someone voices some sort of opinion that's contrary to their interest, they medicalize it. Rather than respond to the political points you're making, they label you a transphobe or an Islamophobe, like you have something mentally wrong with you. Because that's what a phobia is. It's an irrational fear of something. For people with real phobias, like let's say arachnophobia, they're going to viscerally respond if they see a spider, for example. They're going to have a panic attack or a nervous breakdown. But if Joe Rogan were put in the room with a transgendered person, he would not have this type of reaction. Oh my god! Oh my god! So it makes no sense to call him a transphobe or to call Gavin McGinnis an Islamophobe. By using this type of language, Dylan Matthews is basically authoring neoliberal propaganda. And you know that he's writing propaganda because he provides no context for any of these things. The most transparent is the transphobia. Joe Rogan didn't make the comments that he did because he hates transgendered people. He believes that transgendered men who transition to women have an advantage in sports because of the additional testosterone they have in their bodies, because of the opportunities for them to build muscle mass that a man would have prior to transitioning that a woman would not have. These are objective scientific facts. So when Joe Rogan says something along the lines of he doesn't believe that transgendered women should be able to compete in female sports, that this wouldn't be fair, he's clearly expressing a political opinion. But Dylan Matthews just dismisses what he says as transphobia. It's a weaselly way that social justice warriors and neoliberals redirect attention away from a political argument that someone is making to the state of their mental health. Also, the idea that Joe Rogan is some sort of massive racist is contradicted by the actual hyperlink included in Dylan Matthews' article. That article describes a podcast where Joe Rogan described an outing that he had to go see the movie The Planet of the Apes. 
During the podcast, he's quoted as saying, we get out, we're giggling, we're going to go see Planet of the Apes. We walk into the Planet of the Apes. We walked into Africa, Rogan says in the clip. Well, when I think of great apes, things like chimpanzees and gorillas, you know, the type of apes that appear in the movie Planet of the Apes, those happen to be animal species that also happen to live in Africa. So I don't see what's so racist about Joe Rogan making some lame joke that it's weird that when he's going to see the movie, The Planet of the Apes, he happens to be walking in a neighborhood where it's all a bunch of black African people. I mean, sure, you could interpret that in a racist way, but that really says more about you than it necessarily says about Joe Rogan. But if there were any doubts, Joe Rogan, later on in the podcast, according to this same article, apologizes in case what he said came off as racist. The article goes on further. Rogan went on to explain what a positive experience it was to see a movie in a black neighborhood and did impressions of some of the people he met. Rogan then went on to decry the lack of black representation in films, including in Rise of the Planet of the Apes, and he criticized a trailer in which Jonah Hill was talking black to a black character. Does that sound like a massive racist to you? But let's get back to the Vox article. The article continues, but the fight also reflects a sincere frustration in the trans community over transphobia being treated as marginal and forgivable. My colleague Caitlin Burns makes this point brutally and succinctly, and the article includes Caitlin Burns' tweet, there's not a single candidate in the field who wouldn't sacrifice trans rights for enacting their signature piece of legislation. How unbelievably out of touch and stupid are these people. Oh my god. So the part of the population that is transgendered is what? 0.1%? A politician would have to be out of their mind to make 0.1% of the population the hallmark of their political campaign. That would be political suicide. Forget the economy, forget the wars in the Middle East, forget all of that. If you elect me president, I will make sure that male to female transgendered people are able to compete in women's sports so that the 1% of the 0.1% of the population that represents transgendered people who want to play sports make sure that they're able to play those sports. I'm pretty certain that if you looked at the population and compared the number of people who watch Joe Rogan's show to the number of transgendered people, there would be far more Joe Rogan fans than transgendered people. Dylan Matthews continues, but I think the debate has also been profoundly revealing about a divide within left of center American political discourse. A divide that maps closely, but not perfectly, with the divide between socialist-identified, Bernie-supporting leftists on the one hand and more traditional liberal Democrats on the other. The divide concerns the latent moral theories that each side uses, and in particular, whether they think political disagreements regarding discrimination and bigotry can be understood using the same moral language as disagreements about, say, tax policy or foreign affairs. So I think what the author is trying to say here is that there's really two ideologies at play in the contemporary American left. There's the progressive neoliberal ideology that Vox journalists seem to embrace, and then there's the more traditional class-based Marxist ideology that socialists and communists have. This is one thing that infuriates me when watching Sargon of Akkad videos, because he always acts like the social justice warriors are the Marxist, but they're not Marxist. They're liberals. They're a specific type of liberal, one that focuses on liberating what they view as certain oppressed marginalized groups like transgendered people, but they are in fact liberals. That is what their ideology is about. The reason social justice warriors advocate for things like 
quotas and affirmative action and stuff like that isn't because they want 100% equality. It's that they think these things are necessary to liberate these supposedly oppressed groups, to give them more options, more ability to pursue their individual rights and individual lives. The Marxist goal of absolute equality is a lot more closely linked to socialist type thinkers, people like Bernie Sanders, people who are really concerned about social class and class warfare and things like that. Dylan Matthews describes the approach to morality that social justice warriors such as himself take is a deontological approach. Under his worldview, morality works as a set of a bunch of bright line moral rules. If someone is to break even just one of these rules, then they must be, I guess, in his view, exiled from society. For example, I don't think there's anything that Joe Rogan could ever do to redeem himself in the eyes of Dylan Matthews or any of these other social justice warrior Vox journalists. It's like Joe Rogan broke a sacred law of social justice and therefore he should not be associated with, he should not be conversed with, whenever his name is brought up, he should be denounced. If he tries to endorse you, you need to disavow. This social justice warrior moral absolutism is, of course, complete bullshit. There are no sacred moral rules, and you can't judge the morality of an action without knowing the context in which it took place in. For example, you cannot judge Joe Rogan for his comments about transgenderism without knowing that the context of those comments were him discussing the particular controversy involving transgendered athletes. You can't consider Joe Rogan a racist because of the comments he made about Planet of the Apes without understanding the context of those comments. You said gas the Jews 23 times. What's funny about that? The context of it is the juxtaposition of having an adorable animal react to something vulgar. That was the entire point of the joke. Have you seen the video? Do you accept you committed a crime? Have you seen the video? I have. Right, okay, so I've explained the context in it, so why are you asking me again? Well, uh, the, the context is that you've been fined £800 pounds for yeah. a crime that no, you committed. No, we're talking about the context of the video. Uh, and, Don't and try and, and move and on, and mate. We, we had in court... <laughs> yeah, okay, can I just you, ask? Why did we had in court that no. you committed uh-huh. uh, gross offence against... Uh, a large community of people. Six million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. You just said the statement a couple of seconds ago. Why should I consider your context if you're not concerning mine? You've broken the law. Do you regret breaking the you law? You just broke the law two seconds ago when you said the phrase. Remember, context matters, mate. Human morality does not exist in a vacuum. The liberal worldview, which I assume someone like Immanuel Kant, the guy who came up with deontological ethics, would sign on to, is based upon the falsehood that human beings exist in a state of nature and that they form a government through a social contract in order to protect themselves from other people existing in the same state of nature. However, that's not true. It's contradicted by biology and human history. Jonathan Haidt, once again someone who I've talked quite a bit about on this channel, writes in his book, A Righteous Mind, that the state of nature is a lie. It never existed. Human beings always lived in groups. We evolved together into tribes or communities. And the moral intuitions that human beings were gained through evolution as well. When people like Dylan Matthews postulate the existence of these bright line moral rules that can never be violated, and if someone does violate them, they get completely divorced from society, and that these rules apply regardless of context, they're not being honest. They're being autistic. Real morality comes from the content and virtue of someone's character. How someone acts in a particular context is what is important. People cannot be judged to be moral or immoral based on whether they adhere to a bunch of made-up rules by people who self-identify as social justice warriors. Can you imagine a conservative making similar arguments to this? Like if I were to say that it's wrong to defend illegal immigration— And that anyone who ever said anything supporting illegal immigration, they need to be completely shut out of society. That this amounts to a bright line moral rule. 
that can never be crossed by anyone, regardless of the context. How ballistic do you think people like Dylan Matthews would respond if, for example, President Trump made an argument like that? But it's classic neoliberal propaganda to act like there's just these moral rules that exist that everyone has to follow. And of course, it's the neoliberal establishment that makes these rules. They're not decided on any sort of democratic basis. People don't vote whether there needs to be absolute support and tolerance for transgenderism. No, the elites just tell us that we have to accept this. It's like individual rights. They don't actually exist. Whenever the neoliberal class needs one, though, they can just make one magically appear. You know, like the constitutional right to an abortion that seemed to have magically appeared in the U.S. Constitution sometime in the 1960s. Because I've read it a bunch of times, and I, I still haven't seen it in there. I still don't see the right to an abortion. But the neoliberal ruling class through the least democratic political institution in this country, the Supreme Court, deems that this is a right that exists, so now we have to deal with it. Just like how we now have to be tolerant of transgendered people. Now, I don't recall reading anything in the Constitution about transgendered people, but I have a feeling that if a state were to pass a law banning transgenderism, that law would be struck down mighty fast as being unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. Because remember, the United States is not a real democracy. It's a dictatorship by a technocratic neoliberal managerial class. The article then describes how the moral absolutism of the social justice warriors contrast with the moral consequentialism that the left-wing Bernie Sanders people support. From their perspective, a Joe Rogan endorsement means that Bernie Sanders is more likely to be elected. And since they support Bernie Sanders, then that's a good thing, regardless of any past controversies that Joe Rogan may have been involved with. People who are pro-Joe Rogan endorsement then criticize the people who are against it, arguing that they're hypocrites, since a lot of them supported Hillary Clinton, who was endorsed by Henry Kissinger. Dylan Matthews also writes, My colleague Ezra Klein, okay, Ezra Klein is not your colleague, he's your boss. He's the guy who owns Vox. He's not your colleague. Anyways, he writes, My colleague Ezra Klein was the rare liberal making the leftist style argument in this case. He pointed to Colin Powell, the former Secretary of State, who was at least in part responsible for the Iraq War and the hundreds of thousands of deaths that it has caused, and whose support Barack Obama trumpeted in 2008. And predictably, upon making this argument, Ezra Klein managed to piss off a bunch of left-wing black people for comparing Colin Powell to Joe Rogan. And I'm inclined to agree with the black people, not because I find Ezra Klein to be in insufferable douchebag. But how can you compare Colin Powell, a black man who managed to rise through the ranks in the military to become an influential figure in government, to Joe Rogan, who sits around doing podcasts smoking pot all the time? When I think of the neoconservatives who really pushed us into war with Iraq and Afghanistan, Colin Powell is not one of the first people I think of. Very few people would put Colin Powell as the guy who was really making the decisions on invading Iraq. I think a lot of people would agree that people like Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, George W. Bush were a lot more instrumental in making those decisions. Sure, Colin Powell was in the administration and he defended their actions. But if he weren't in that administration, if he resigned because he disagreed with it, it really seems unlikely to me that that would have changed anything. I think all of those people who died still would have died. So it seems absolutely bizarre to me that Vox would take the position that Colin Powell is responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths. By that same logic, couldn't you say that Barack Obama is responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths 
because his policy towards the Iraq and Afghanistan war were to let those wars continue. Couldn't I argue that pretty much everyone in the U.S. government was responsible for millions and millions of deaths along the U.S.-Mexican border because they failed to secure the border and they allowed drugs to constantly be smuggled through the ports of entry? That if they had just completely closed down the border with Mexico, that endless amounts of violence and millions upon millions of deaths in both the U.S. and Mexico would not happen if they just did that. I will repeat what I said earlier. The only type of moral reasoning that makes sense is to look at a decision in the particular context that it's being made. You just broke the law two seconds ago when you said the phrase. Remember, context matters, mate. Deeming someone immoral because they were involved in a presidential administration that took actions that resulted in a lot of people dying doesn't make a whole lot of sense if they're not the ones primarily making these decisions. Dylan Matthews further writes, you could also interpret it as a case for abandoning these hard constraints altogether and trying to think of all these cases in purely hard-headed consequentialist terms. On this logic, it's okay for Sanders to woo Rogan for the same reason it was okay for Barack Obama to invite an anti-gay pastor to his inauguration and to play into racist stereotypes by urging young black men to pull their pants up. These accommodations with bigotry help Sanders and Obama, respectively, to gain power where they can do more to undermine bigotry than they can out of power. Yeah, it seems to make perfect sense to me. If Bernie Sanders wants to win, he should be pragmatic, not autistic. Bernie Sanders can accept an endorsement from Joe Rogan without necessarily agreeing with 100% of everything Joe Rogan has ever said or did. To think otherwise would be stupid and shallow. The world is not entirely black and white. We're not in a battle of the good people versus the evil people. Pragmatism and civility are actually pretty important values to have. And I'm sorry if this offends you, Dylan Matthews, but that pastor that Barack Obama had speak, I think he's giving pretty good advice. All these black kids with sagging pants showing their boxer shorts look absolutely ridiculous. If you want people to care about you or take you seriously, pull your damn pants up. This is a perfect example of the type of working class common sense advice that neoliberal managerial class people like Dylan Matthews absolutely despise. Social justice warriors like Dylan Matthews want nothing more than to be able to liberate black youths from the social constraints of having to wear pants that covers your underwear. To a working class person like myself, it's kind of hard to believe that anyone would ever object to advice as simple as make sure your pants are pulled up all the way, but that's neoliberalism for you. Unsurprisingly, Dylan Matthews ends this article in the most weaselly way possible. He indicates that the sort of pragmatism advocated by the pro-Joe Rogan endorsement people is found to be morally repugnant by many people. Who these many people are is unstated. He then says most people think there are some rules too fundamental to be subject to means ends reasoning. Who are these most people? What is this consensus that you're referring to, Dylan? Did you conduct a poll? How do you know that most people believe in these bullshit rules that you just made up? Even though he gave you the position that he thinks most people have, he himself refuses to commit to one of these positions. You see guys, Dylan Matthews is just a fence sitter. He's not trying to push an agenda in this article. He's not someone who's trying to pass off what is clearly neoliberal propaganda as some sort of even-handed opinion piece of which he takes no position in the claims that he discusses. It's not like Vox is some biased partisan media company that's undergirded by a neoliberal ideology. They just report on objective truth. 
and they let the reader decide, right? Well, that's all that I've got to say about this absolute dumpster fire of an article. I definitely feel dumber having read that. Anyways, if you like this video and you're not already subscribed to my channel, please subscribe.